It is February the 9th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. Hello there, this is Chris. And Hi, it's Henry. With me is Henry. <laughs> good morning. A wonderful good morning. How are you today? Ah, we have, we're snowed in. Germany is snowed in. Um, we're at least northern Germany. I live near Hanover and it's like this much snow. As you can see, if you're listening to the podcast, <laughs> it's it's a lot to shovel. Oh, but it's go, it's okay. It's it's like actual winter here. Finally, I, I, I how it I used love, to be. How you back in my child? You know, you know. Um, uh, I was I was a kid in the, in the late seventies, and here in Germany, seventy eight was was a, one of the craziest winters ever. And this is what what fa this is what. Um, made me think as a kid that all winters are like that i mean we we built igloos and it was like me meters high uh, of snow and uh, i thought all winters would be like that and i've been disappointed of winters ever since because just, of just imagine like kids who grow up now might just not be used to that um, anymore they might find it quite nice for the first <laughs> 5 10 20 minutes and then get super annoyed by it <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I've been out shoveling and stuff, but um, it's sunny. It's wonderful. It's perfect. So it's a nice morning workout. It is. So let's see what we have today. Um, we of course kick this episode off with a new segment. Um, we are going to revisit. If if I find the right buttons, uh, <laughs> we are going to revisit um, the nonical Arctic oil spill in Russia. In Norilsk in May the 2020, you might remember. Oil spill in Arctic history. Yes, and they are now, um, they, they've now been fined to pay a 140, no, 18 billion rubles or something <laughs> like that. 1.62 billion euros um, for the oil spill. That's the fine that they have to pay that yeah so. and, and Nornickel of course um tries to appeal against that um they argue that the the costs or yeah the cost of the cleanup have been significantly lower and um yeah it's it's very interesting to see that uh, in in russia one of the richest oligarchs who is the person behind Nornickel, and also the person behind the financing of the new Antarctic station of Vostok um, <laughs> finally gets a quite huge fine for um, environmental oil spill. Yeah, that's just really great to see. It is, it is, and um, yeah, they've, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that they cannot just get away with spilling that much oil into a very, very <clears throat> into a very sensitive uh, part of nature. Particular because the, the the whole topic kind of disappeared. It really didn't happen that much in, in Western media. It was there for a few days and then it completely disappeared. And I'm I'm really glad that it didn't disappear in in Russia. That um, yeah, state authority at least um, yeah sued the mm. pe the person responsible for that. That's, that's or the company in this case. Pretty good. Oh, my microphone was off. Okay, good. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of these days. Um, second and last piece of news is um, Paul Grisham found his wallet, which wouldn't be <laughs> which wouldn't be worth mentioning here. But uh, what's the details behind that one? It's a very funny story. Um, Grisham was part of Operation Deep Freeze, and if you remember that, that's quite some years back. It's actually fifty three years back, and part of that uh, US mission. He was a, a meteorologist on board. He didn't even want to go down to Antarctica because he just had two toddlers back home. Um, but he went and then he just lost his wallet somewhere and forgot about that. And then suddenly got a ship per mail because the people who found it actually at McMurdo station because they uh, wrecked down uh, one old building and in that building were lockers and behind the locker they found the wallet they made him 
um, yeah, they, they, they really tra tracked him down and uh, just sent the, the wallet to him and he already <laughs> forgot about it completely. And that was and that was when he lost it was 53 years ago. So this it was is, around uh, 30 when he when he lost it. And now he's 91. It's just amazing. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, <laughs> with, with amazing memories connected to it, he says, and uh, oh, totally. it's, it's it's really great to see that. Really, really nice. It's a lovely Definitely. story. So let's get into today's episode one, two, three. Episode one, two, three, one twenty three. <clears throat> um, a brief history of the discovery of Antarctica. Um, you have sent me what what you usually do <laughs> when 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 we begin a show um the, and you prepare that you usually have a bunch of links with like visuals for the video part of the of the podcast and uh today it's like maps maps and maps so i will probably lose the overview um so you'll have to help me if i bring up the wrong <laughs> map so let me just bring up the first map and let's uh, dive right into the topic yeah, the topic, um, the brief history of the discovery of Antarctica um, has been requested by uh, Robert, who wrote us a, a long email with very nice comments and uh, very nice observations, um, nice book reviews, by the way, and also um, one sentence where he said it would help a lot to put the discovery of Antarctica a little bit into context, because at some point it's not really um, clear why things happened and when they happened. And let's start just from very, very beginning. Um, why do people actually travel south? That's just because that there, there was a belief for the existence of um, a landmass deep down in the south. And that belief dates back to the very, very beginning of classical geography. Um, and those beginnings, they came together with the idea of symmetry in nature. Well, when you look at a snowflake, it looks very symmetric. And those kind of symmetrics have been found in a number of occasions. And ge uh, geographers have taken over that idea of symmet uh, symmetry and just thought, all those land masses in the north, they must have a balance somewhere in the south. Mm. And the land that was discovered until then in the south didn't make up for everything that was up north. So they, they postulated the idea, there must be something we haven't found yet, and it must be significant. I and mean, this, one, one, part of, uh, one part of this is true, because um, <laughs> the north is very cold and the south is very cold. So at least in that respect, there is kind of a balance, isn't there? There is indeed. And it's very interesting to see that this kind of a belief, that this kind of a concept actually translates to some degree into today's geography. So they actually um, used yeah, this, this belief and put a number of names onto that. There's hypothetical land um, got named uh, Terra Australis Ignota, Terra Australis Incognita, Terra Australis Nondum Cognita, which basically everything translates a little bit into the unknown land of the South, the Southern land not yet known. Then there was also the so-called Southern Brazil or my favorite Magellanica, the land of Magellan, who mm. actually traveled to South America. We will get to there in a minute. Also, Ora Antarctica, the Antarctic land or Australis Ora, the Austral country. And this map we have in the video here right now is a map that dates back to the second century AD to Ptolemy, who was or is referred to most of the time as the father of modern geography. He believed that the Indian Ocean was enclosed on the south by land, so that there was a continent down there, a landmass. But he also thought that Africa was connected to that land and by that closes off the Indian Ocean. He, as you can see in that, in that map, wasn't really detailed on uh, Africa. There's a very nice detailed map already of the Mediterranean Sea, of um, Europe in general. Also, the, uh, the, the Arab Peninsula looks uh, actually very detailed. But apart from that, not much has been um, discovered there. I mean, that's still quite some time to uh, second century AD. That's quite something. 
However, with this postulation, with this map, he actually set a standard for the next 1,500 years and virtually every map, map, map maker of the, that time accepted this geography as the authority on the shape and size of the world. And if you go to the second map, you can actually see how that historic map just got adapted. It's particularly the same map here we see, it's just a different style, just much, much younger. So the scholars have just taken over the geographic world worldview of um, Ptolemy and just transfer that into more modern times. And uh, and apparently they believe that big heads were around the map <laughs> to, to, to create the wind. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> the, the size of that theoretical continent that's uh, supposed to be down in the south, um, that reached its greatest extent in the 16th century. And if you swap over to the next map, you actually see um, that it has it had different sizes throughout the, the centuries. So in the 16th century, it was the greatest extent. Then it shrank in the 17th century, where this map comes from. And then the next map shows how it then blows up again later on in the 18th century. You see the big landmass down in the south um, on those both globes. On those maps around the um, 18th century, it usually covered almost a quarter of the entire planet, this huge southern continent. The reason for that, the, the thinking behind that, was mainly driven by French and by English scholars and their desire to actually have a great fertile southern continent which is rich in resources to actually rival the discovery of the new world and the resources found there, which mainly got to, to Spain and um, partly to England as well. Um, this is a very interesting thing to, to, to understand that the, the drive behind that, the urge to find the land there, actually came from a rivalry to actually find some more resources, something that's better to, to or yeah, that's even richer. That's that's interesting because uh, looking at um, some of the actions we see um, through global warming, where some of the um, th uh, geopolitical things change and the resource hunger comes up again up in the Arctic, for example, um, is it, it's it's almost like this is mirrored by, or this is a mirror of what happened back then. It is a little bit like history repeats itself over and over again, yeah. and you can really adopt that to a number of events uh, in history. Even the discovery of the Northwest Passage or the exploration to actually discover um, the Northwest Passage has particularly the same background. They were just looking for an easier trade route um, to bypass the Spanish dominance in uh, South America um, to, to find an easier way to Asia. Um, then the Portuguese uh, around Africa, so they actually separated the Southern Hemisphere there, and the English just were looking for a different passage. And you can see those kind of uh, patterns down in the South as well. It just happened, um, yeah, pretty much at the same time. A little later, the start for um, um, yeah, the, the initial part of um, Antarctica. Actually, it was then um, eventually James Cook, a British sailor, um, with uh, the voyage, his second voyage of 1772 to 75, which finally destroyed the dream of that vast inhabitant um, Terra Australis incognita, because the the belief was it's a huge landmass uh, reaching far up into northern latitudes, connected uh, with other landmasses, and he travelled three years around. We will just look at that voyage a little later three years around the globe without touching base at all um, on a continent. He discovered a number of islands, but not a significant continental landmass. So he came back and just kind of destroyed that without really destroying it because, and that's something we come back later, he utterly believed in there must be something down there we still haven't found yet. When we talk about Terra Australis incognita today, that's often mixed up with the discovery of, of um, Australia. But that was never the case in the 18th century. 
the contemporaries of the 18th century, which were along um, James Cook, they knew that Australia um, was separate from an imagined um, further southern uh, continent. And the name Terra Australia, um, or the name Australia for the landmass of Australia, only applied in the 19th century. Prior to that, it was um, called New Holland because it was discovered by Dutchmen and they had New Holland and New Zealand, which are two Dutch provinces, right? Holland and Zealand. And just renaming them, um, you're very creative. Uh, the English actually copied that <laughs> later on with New South Wales and uh, stuff. So we, we have um, here a mix up. Australia took on the name of Australia and just removed the New Holland simply because nobody in Australia thought at that time that there could be a landmass further south than Australia, which is reasonable thought, right? But at the same time, the lost name of Australia, um, the South Polar continent, they just became nameless. Uh, there was no Terra Australia anymore because Australia actually was discovered. So, so what, what did they call it? Did they, they just called make, it Antarctica. Make up Antarctica? Antarctica dates back much, much, uh, much, much earlier. So it's actually, it dates back to Marinus of Tyre, which is a, a Hellenic geographer from the second century AD, pretty Ooh. much the same time as um, Ptolemy. But it was actually 18, the 1890s where Antarctica was uh, mainly used to describe the Southern land because Australia has taken over the Terra Australia incognita and just said, it's discovered Australia is here. And if you find, if you if you search for the name Terra Australia Incognita, you will find a number of research papers that actually refer to the discovery of Australia rather than Antarctica, because that has been just the um, writing of history after uh, Australia has taken over the name of Australia. However, the actual discovery of the presumed southern land had still wait, to wait a long, long time. It needed the rounding of Cape Horn and the Cape of Good Hope in the 15th and 16th century to actually prove that the unknown south on land, if it is existed, was a continent on its own and not connected to um, any other landmass. And uh, Ferdinand Magellan, he discovered the, the Straits of Magellan in uh, 1520, and he assumed that the islands of uh, Tierra del Fuego, which is in the south, the southernmost tip of uh, South America, that they were the extension of the so-called unknown southern land. And it appeared as such on a map by um, Abram Otelius, who actually connects the southern tip of Antarctica to the uh, Antarctic. And it took... Is that the next one here on the list? Yes, that's the map from Ortelius, yep. exactly. And you can see that South America doesn't really have the shape we know today. It, it looks like a big block and then the southernmost tip connected to the vast, vast land, even this map with roughly a quarter of um, the whole globe being uh, covered by the southern uh, continent. And then it took until 1615 um, for two Dutchmen to discover that Tierra del Fuego is not connected to the southern land that it actually is a group of islands and that the extent of uh, uh, tierra del fuego is much much smaller than expected then in 1772 um, it was a frenchman called uh, yves de caguillen um, who discovered the two days known caguillen islands and back then he believed um, because he discovered them in a very foggy very misty um, day, he believed that this is a veritable uh, Eden in the South Seas. So he returned to France claiming that his the, the new territory of South France, as he named it, was kind of a of an Eden that provides a lot of wealth for for France. So he actually was sent on a second expedition the same year, the very same year, 1772, and went down again just to find out it's a very bleak and unforgiving place. It's very, very difficult to land on that island. So when he came back, he actually um, 
received a lot of disgrace and uh, actually imprisonment in Bastille Ooh. by a very disappointed uh, Louis the Sixteenth. That's what you get from promising too much. <laughs> don't Indeed. don't overpromise and underdeliver. <laughs> After that, for a very, very long time, those islands have been um, have been known as the land of desolation or desolation islands before that actually got renamed to what we know now <laughs> as Kegulin Islands. So that you will still find some maps um, where they are um, named as desolation islands. So now we are coming to one of the most popular explorers when it comes to an Arctic discovery, and that's James Cook. So he had a first circumnavigation of the globe and he really didn't resolve the um, issue of Terra Australis incognita. So he was dispatched again by the Admiralty to finally prove or disprove the existence of this huge um, hypothetical landmass. So he set out from Cape Town in 1772, the same year when Kerguelen was um, yeah, discovering the islands. And on January 17, 1773, he was the first one who officially crossed the Antarctic Circle in recorded history. That's a huge, huge milestone. So he actually went as far south as we know in the north. We have the, um, the, the Arctic Circle, which means kind of the border into the polar region. His ship got however repeatedly pushed back by how he described it firm fields of vast mountains of ice and it's believed that he came within about 240 kilometers which is around 150 miles of the antarctic mainland during this voyage and this epic three-year circumnavigation just imagine that we're talking about the 1770s three years of sailing in the polar environment of an Arctica, not being able to actually really touch land mm -hmm. because of the ice you face. It's just incredible when we think about how we travel today to imagine three years circumnavigation. However, in those three years, Cook fixed a number of islands which were imprecisely mapped and he actually also disproved the existence of many other islands. But his final crossing of the Antarctic Circle, that happened around January 13th in 1774, when his ship actually reached the latitude of 71 degree 10 minutes south and the longitude of 106 degree and 54 minutes west. And you can actually see on the map we have um, on the video, you see the, the yellow dot up next to my video screen this is oh no it's under my video screen actually hold it's, on i'll move you i'll move you to the side give me a second <laughs> i can take care of that there Here is a little go. pin and yes perfect <laughs> it's a little pin that's the furthest south um recorded in the locks of um james cook and it is what is known today as the palmer peninsula it's actually part of the Amundsen sea and if you imagine that's 240 kilometers away from one of the most active areas in terms of carving glaciers with the two most notorious uh, glaciers in modern history Thrites Glacier and Pine Island Glacier which you possibly know already a little bit um, from our series and obviously he couldn't touch land because they just produce so much ice and icebergs that there's literally no chance to go on land. But he was so, so close and returned after three years, never touching the continent. But he was full of hope and he stated in his journal, I firmly believe that there is a tract of land near the pole, which is the source of most of the ice, which is spread over this vast Southern Ocean. And that was then the driver of a following explorers to actually go further and to to prove james cook right or wrong so in 1819 an english merchant brick called williams was under the command of william smith 
they reported that they found land south of Cape Horn and no one has known land down there before. So he actually landed on, on Livingston Island on February 19, 1819 and realized later that it was part of a chain of islands which we know today as the South Shetland Islands. So he found some remnants on Livingston Island and signs of a wreckage of a Spanish uh, ship called San Telmo, but to date nobody really knows if any of the crew members of the San Telmo actually reached um, Livingston Island alive because the ship actually sank, it just got off course, it was supposed to um, navigate around Cape, uh, Cape Horn, just got off course, blown away, and then sank close to Living, uh, Livingston Island and we don't really know if they actually touched the the land uh, prior to uh, William Smith. However, the Admiralty decided um, that the islands merit greater study and they sent Edward Bransfield, a naval lieutenant, on to explore further. And after quick stop on King George Island, which was named and claimed for Great Britain by Smith just the, the same year, they discovered on January 30th, 1820, the northernmost tip of the Antarctic mainland, which is called Trinity Peninsula today. Let me bring up that map. That's um, a map with a lot of other expeditions that happened afterwards, right? Exactly. So that uh, covers a number of expeditions until, I think, 1897. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a, a big bunch of colors in there. Not so easy to uh, look at, but we will go through that um, piece by piece. However, he actually um, touched um, Trinity Peninsula. They didn't go uh, ashore though. So they, they just saw the peninsula. Uh, they um, claimed it for Britain. They said that's like a big continent. And after their return to Valparaiso, Bransfield added to the confusion of geographs, uh, ge geographers back in the days by calling the new client lands New South Shetland at the same time when Smith was calling the islands they discovered the South Shetland Islands. And both names were used indiscriminately through much of the early 19th century. At the same time, the industry responded very quickly to the discovered new lands and in particular the sealing industry. So the sealer, hair sealer, they get great success in seal hunting in, in the South Shetlands. And in 1820, a fleet of seven bricks and one sloop made their way down. But as hunting became much, much more difficult because the steady hunting reduced the number of seal rookeries, the sloop, which was used for scouting seals under the command of Nathaniel Palmer, was forced to scout even further away from the sealers base on Deception Island. So they needed to go further than anyone before. And it was on the 18th of November, 1820, that Palmer saw the Antarctic Peninsula, as he stated, land not yet laid down on my chart. And he became the first American to officially see the mainland. After his sighting, uh, he returned with a ship to the base of Deception Island and they were mooring um, during thick, thick fog, so they couldn't see much um, at the time. But when they wake, uh, woke up in the morning, they just figured out that they were anchoring alongside two Russian ships called Vostok and Myrny. And those were the ships of the Russian expedition to the South Polar Seas under the command of a Baltic German in the service of the Russians called Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen quite a name because today we have the Bellingshausen Sea and he will actually get very very popular today. Who actually discovered the southern continent has been very very hardly disputed chiefly on, on nationalistic grounds primarily between the British and the Americans. The British obviously supported Bransfield and Smith while the Americans supported Palmer and the controversy racked for over a century with accusations of willful misinterpretation of accounts and locks um, rigged up to claims and uh, counterclaims for forgery was really a difficult time 
Hard in to that prove, regard. Right? It's very difficult to prove. It eventually comes with the ship's look, and that's the important thing here. In fact, the very first person to actually see the continent was neither British nor American, but was almost certainly the Russian Admiral von Bellingshausen. This wasn't realized, however, until his records became available to the West almost a century after his discovery. And that actually was uh, fuel to the debate between the Brits and the Americans about if it was Bransfield or Palmer that actually um, discovered it first. Besides his discovery, Bellingshausen's discovery, um, his ships were the first since Cook to actually cross the Antarctic Circle in late January 1820. And now we think back, it was 1774 when he, no, 73 when, when James Cook crossed it the first time. It took till 1820 for another ship to cross the Antarctic Circle. And he actually not only crossed the Antarctic Circle, Bellingshausen also approached Antarctic mainland. Uh, main, mainland. And the first confirmed sighting of mainland Antarctica happened on the 27th of January 1820. And three days prior to Bransfield's discovery on the other side of Antarctica. The sighting of the extensive ice fields was reported on the ship's lock and Bransfield, uh, Brans uh, Bellingshausen believed that they were looking on floating ice rather than mainland. And the men of the two ships were unaware that they were the first humans to look on the continent. Today, it's believed, according to the logs, that the Russian expedition reached on 28th of January uh, 1820, a point within 32 kilometers, 20 miles, from what's today Princess Martha Coast, and recorded the site of an ice shelf at 69 degrees, 21 minutes south, 2 degrees and 14 minutes west, which is today known as the Fimbul Ice Shelf. This is kind of a very interesting turn here, because after this meeting with Palmer at Deception Island, Ballingshausen invited the Americans on board the ships, discussed the respective um, explorations, and the, the, the very interesting aspect of both Ballingshausen and Palmer's accounts of this remarkable encounter is that neither had realized the significance of their discovery. While Ballingshausen noted that Palmer had spotted some un uh, unidentified land somewhere in the south, Palmer himself did not even put the sighting into his logbook, which of course was then part of the huge debate of the, um, of the fight, if it was Bransfield or Palmer. The first landing later on in Antarctica is thought to have been made by the American Captain John Davis, um, after which also the Davis Strait uh, between uh, Greenland and uh, Baffin Island is named. He was a sealer and he claimed to have set foot at Hughes Bay near the northernmost tip of the Antarctic Peninsula for less than an hour. They were just looking for seals. Um, this still is not quite accepted by all historians. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica did not occur for another 74 years until 1895, when a group of Norwegians actually went ashore um, to collect geological specimen at Cape Adare. That's a long, long time. So several expedition uh, expeditions attempted to reach the South Pole in the early 20th century during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. On the map, we actually see the um, points of the three um, most important facts. You see the the, the, the furthest top um, arrow, that's actually where Bellingshausen is supposed to have um, spotted or seen Antarctica. The first um, on the left side, that's where Bransfield has uh, seen Antarctica. And at the bottom, the arrow there, that's where James Cook has um, had his furthest south not seen Antarctica being so, so close and still haven't touched any base. And if you just look at the shape of Antarctica, it's quite a surprise that Cook on his circumnavigation 
didn't touch the Antarctic Peninsula because it reaches so far north. But then, of course, with the winter ice packs drifting and the strong current there, it might have just been really, really bad luck that they just got um, adrift a little bit out of sight. That's a pretty amazing, um, very, very, very brief summary of the Antarctic discovery. And you possibly heard a number of names you never heard before because you usually heard the big names like Shackleton, like Amundsen and Scott. Without those very, very early explorers, they would never have become heroes of the heroic age of Antarctic um, discovery because it really needs the first, the basic work to actually explore it, to map it. And I really can um, recommend to pick a book called um, The Mapping of Antarctica. I just have it here, which is a pretty amazing book um, which just summarizes not so much the um, heroic exploration, but a number of maps and how those maps just got more and more detailed, leading to what today is the, the, the most detailed continent we have on Earth, Antarctica. And I'm really, really sure we're going to have very soon a little mini series on um, expeditions to Antarctica, just because I really want to introduce you those people a little bit more. Amazing. Wow. Uh, yeah. Again, I'm speechless as to what what cool stuff you've put together for us. And this is an episode that was um, requested by a listener. And uh, so can you, if you want to get a, like a more detailed insight into something or an update on a previous topic or have a suggestion, uh, let us know um, and get in touch. We are, of course, on the social media you can find us at curiously polar on the twitters on insta we have a website curiouslypolar.com we are on wherever you find your podcast so if you're not subscribed to this in your podcast client then go ahead and do this and um yeah we'll be back in a week with more stuff until then everyone take care and have a good one bye-bye bye-bye